I'm sure you know that Rome was built on top of seven hills. The most famous is the Palatine Hill. On top of the Palatine Hill, there, there is the Imperial Palace. But for the ancient Romans, there was another hill important like the Palatine. It was the Capitoline Hill, Capitolium in Latin. And on top of it, there was a huge temple. 2,500 years ago, the Capitoline Hill was known with another name, Tarpeian Rock. And today, I will tell you the story of how the Tarpeian Rock became the Capitolium. Once upon a time, there was a king, the seventh king of Rome, Tarquinius Superbus, the super one. He was not so tall, he was short, actually, and he had a rounded belly, the typical fat belly of a man who drank too much. And around his eyes, he had black lines, the typical black eyes of someone who never slept enough. But he had a voice, a beautiful voice, a music, a magic. With that voice, if he wanted, he could raise the spirits of the people who heard him high in the sky. Or if he wanted, he could throw in despair the people who heard him. And the Romans, the Romans told in whispers that with a single gaze, Tarquinius could hear, if he locked his eyes on yours, he could hear your heart, beat after beat. And if he wanted, only with the power of his eyes, he could tore into pieces your heart. They were scared of him, and rightly so. He was a king, but at the same time, he was a tyrant. And he was ambitious. He wanted to leave a mark of his passage on this earth. So one day, one day he called all the workers of the kingdom and he said to them, Listen to me, my workers. I want to finish a great thing. I want to leave a monument to my family consecrated to the God to remember forever me and my family. I want to finish what my father couldn't, because he died too early. I want to finish the temple of Jupiter, Optimus Maximus, on top of the Tarpeian rock. And it has to be the largest temple of Italy. Everyone would admire it. So, start to work. Otherwise, you will feel my fury on your skin. And the workers, they started immediately. And they started to dug the, the huge foundations of this temple. They started to dug in the winter. And they continued in spring, then in summer, then in autumn. Then it was winter again. And again it was spring. So one hour, one year and a half later, they were still digging. One day, one day, one of the workers he found a boulder in the foundation. But it was strange, a strange soft rock. So he took away from the earth the, the rock and he started to polish it. And with horror, he realized it was not a rock. It was a human head buried in the earth who knows how many years ago. And it was still pristine. There was flesh in it. There were hairs, beard, a goatee, and blood was still spilling from the wood. The face was covered with tiny scars. It was for sure the face of a warrior who, so, who suffered a lot of wounds. And on the forehead there was an inscription. An inscription in characters, in letters so obscure that no one could read it. The worker was, obviously, he was frightened. So he took the head in his hands and he ran down from the Tarpeia rock. He ran down in the valley of the Forum. He entered in the palace of the king and he asked for an audience. When the king, when the king 
to the head, he recognized that it was a sign of the gods. So he called soothsayers, fortune tellers, prophets all around Rome. And for three days, the prophets studied the head. After three days, the oldest of them, he told to the king, My king, Tarquinius, we have not the wisdom, we don't have the wisdom of this or the skill to read this sign. You have to search the wisdom of the Etruscan prophets, the best of Italy. So Tarquinius did, and he organized an embassy. Three days later, the ambassadors were chosen and found. Three of them, each one of them was a member of one of the three branches of the Roman society. There was a noble, there was a rich man, a merchant, and there was a man from the people. The noble was Cursor, Quintus Papirius Cursor. Cursor in Latin means the runner. And Cursor, well, he was short, old, bold, and fat. And true to his name, he walked very slowly every day, holding his belly with his hands because it was too heavy to transport the runner. And the second one, the rich man, the merchant, well, he was Lucius Matrinius Probus. Probus in Latin means the honest one, the trustworthy. And he was very slim with a long and pointy nose and he had a long goatee that he loved to stroke when he talked. And when he talked with people, he had this strange habit of always hiding one hand behind his back. The trustworthy. The third man was known only with one name, Rusticus. Rusticus in Latin means the man from the countryside. He was a farmer. His hands were large as trees. And the nails, the nails were always dirty with the earth, the earth of his field that he, that he tilled to grow vegetables for his family. And he had a rounded face with a huge smile, bright as the sun. Three days after the call of the king, Rusticus, he found the other two men yelling at each other. They were just outside the Fontinalis gate, the gate of the fountain. And they were yelling at each other for an unknown reason. When they saw Rusticus, he was arriving and he was, and he was sitting on the, on the shoulder of a donkey. A small and old donkey, but very faithful. When they saw him, they, they told, You, Rusticus, you fool! Why you are wasting our time? We were waiting for you. And, and he, when he approached the two men, he said, I beg your pardon, my lords, but I was in the temple of Romulus, Romulus, the first king of Rome, and I was making and I was asking with my prayers a blessing for our journey. The two men, they locked another time their gaze upon each other and they started again to yell, throwing insult after insult. So Rusticus, he waited for a moment of silence. The two and the two men were were panting. After throwing so much insults, they were arguing about who, who had the highest honor, the right to transport the large chest with a human head. And Rusticus said, My lord, I am a very humble man, and by the tradition of Rome, I am forced to pay homage to the nobles and to respect the merchants. So the distance between me and both of you is the same. I am neutral. So let me take this burden on my shoulders. And in this way, we can continue. We can start with this journey. You can, why I transport it, you can continue to argue 
uh, about which one of you has the highest honor. But in this way, at least, I can help this mission. The two adults, two grown, full grown men, well, they felt like kids in front of a parent. So the noble itself, the, the great noble cursor, he looked, he looked Rusticus in his eyes and he said, Rusticus, it's a blessing. You have the wisdom of the common people and I beg your pardon. Let's start this trip. So north they went. They, they entered in each one of the 12 cities of the Etruscan lands, but to no avail. They didn't find a, a single prophet able to read the signs on the, on the forehead or to tell what the gods wanted to say. So south they went, south, in the region near the Greek city of Naples. There were another 12 Etruscan cities, colonies created centuries before. And only in the last city, Cales, Cales only there they found a prophet able to solve their problem. The people of Cales told to the three ambassadors, go in the hills just outside our city and you will find Oleno Caleno the greatest prophet of this generation. They, they followed the instructions and they reached a villa in the outskirts of the city of Cales, a huge villa with fields and, and forests inside the walls. So they started to, to, to ride on, on horses and on donkeys around the walls of the villa one time and they didn't found a single gate. So they went in the other direction, they made a circle around the villa and they didn't found a single door. But they, they wanted to finish their mission, so they tried it the last time. They made another trip around the walls. When they returned to the starting point, they saw a tree. A tree? that was not there before. And sitting by the tree, there was a kid. So the noble Cursor, without dismounting from horse, well, he reached the, the kid and he said from the top, Kid, I am Quintus Papirius Cursor, senator of Rome, from an ancient Roman family. If you are a slave or a servant of Oleno Caleno, you have to tell me where is his doorstep. The kid was playing with walnuts. So he took a look to the noble, he took a walnut and boom, he threw the walnut directly in the center of the forehead of Cursor. So it was the time of the merchant. Probus he dismounted from horse, but he remained standing. He, he approached the kid and he said, Kid, I want to give you a special gift if you help me. Trust me, if you, if you tell us where is the doorstep of Aleno Caleno, I will give you my magical dice. If you throw these two dice, you will always have twelve. You can see for yourself. The kid, he took a look to Probus, he took the dice, and then from a pocket, he took a sling. He put the dice in the sling and whoop, he threw the dice away. And after that, he, he gave the shoulders to the three men. So Rusticus, it was his time. Rusticus is dismounted from his old donkey. From a bag he took a slice of bread and a piece of cheese. He reached the kid and he sat. And without telling a word, he gave food and cheese to the kid. And after the kid tasted 
the the beautiful the beautiful taste of the cheese. Well, Rusticus said, Kid, we need your help. If you are a servant to Master Kaleno, please tell us how to reach his doorstep. And the kid, the kid took a look directly in the eyes of Rusticus. The eyes of the kid were deep blue, the blue of the sky without a cloud. And with the voice of an adult, he said, since you asked so kindly, I will tell you how to reach the doorstep of my master, Oleno Kaleno. He already knows why you're here. He will perform a ritual. He, he wants to steal your head. So beware. I will tell you how to approach and how to speak during, during the ritual. If you follow my story. Rusticus made a bow, then he, he mounted again to, in the saddle of his donkey, and he started to tell to the other two how they could reach properly the doorstep of Kaleno. They, they went to the east, to the east side of the walls, and when Rusticus turned his head to say the last thank you to the kid, the tree and the kid, they disappeared. But there was no time to wander, so they went to the east side of the walls, and there they prayed to the, to the rising sun. Then they went to the north, and they prayed to the north star. Then they went to the west, and they made a prayer to the setting sun. And then they returned to the south, there they prayed for Jupiter, king of the gods. And magically, the doorstep appeared. The servants were very quick to introduce the three ambassadors to Oleno Kaleno. The prophet, a very ancient man with the skin, skin so dry that it seems a desert, looked in the eyes of the three Romans and he thought, well, these three, these three men, they are ignorant. They know nothing about prophecies. They know nothing about magic. They know nothing about the ancient arts. I will trick them. And I will grab for me the power of the head. So without telling a word, he raised his hand and he said, Don't move any further, ambassadors of the Romans. I know you're here in search for answer about the head you, Rusticus, transport on your back. I, we have to perform a ritual, but not today. We have to wait this night. And we'll do this sacrifice and this ritual in my garden, so you will be my guest until this night. When nightfall came from his apartment, from, for, from his private apartment, Oleno, he took a huge staff, a staff carved with obscure symbols, and on top of it, there were tiny bells. He, he gathered in his garden the three ambassadors, and he started to, to chant. In, in the ancient Etruscan language. And with a, with, a, with a staff, he started to draw in the center of his garden, he, he drew, carved in the earth, a diamond shape with four corners. After that, at each of the corner, he put a torch, one for the north, one for the east, one for the south, one for the west. Something this time in Latin, he started to, to give fire to the torches. Then, then chanting with a voice inhuman, in a language that no one, that no one understood, he started to draw the, in the center of the diamond with his staff, the perfect shape, the perfect representation of the Tarpeian rock. When it did so, 
he fell on the ground on his knees. Then he raised his he raised his, his hair, his arms, and he started to pray to Jupiter and to all the other gods. First in Latin, then in the Etruscan language, and finally in the language that no one could understand. He raised his staff up to the sky and with a cry high as no one ever heard the piece of the sky fell on the ground. A black, a black rounded mass, a huge bowl, black as the night, but with the stars still shining bright in Saturn side of it. And the bowl slowly occupied all the space of the image of the Tarpeian rock. Black as the night with a shining star inside it. At that point, Paleno took another time his staff. He pointed the staff to Cursor and he said, Noble ambassador from the ancient city of Rome, member of the Senate, take the head and, and show me where the head was found here. Ambassador Cursor. He remembered the instruction of the kid, and he said the head, the head was found by the Romans between the Romans on top of the Trapeian rock. Uleno took a deep breath. He pointed his staff again, and, and he said, "Rich merchant from Rome, ambassador from the Roman Equites, Probus, I ask you for the second time. Tell me." Tell me where the head was found. Show me the point here in the representation of the Tarpeian rock. Robus was trembling, but he remembered the instructions of the kid. And he only answered the head was found by the Romans, between the Romans, on top of the Tarpeian rock. Oleno was furious. And fire went out from his eyes. So he took for the third time his staff and he pointed the staff to the poor Rusticus. And he said, Rusticus, you common man from the ancient city of Rome, I ask you for the third and the last time, tell me where the head was found. Here on the representation of the Tarpeia rock, show me the point. Rusticus was shot. He almost without words from the fear he felt. But he remembered the instruction of the kids, and he said with a tremble voice, the head was found by the Romans, between the Romans, on the top of the Tarpeian rock. And the words, the words felt very, very warm in, a heart, in his heart. At that point, Kaleno, Kaleno remained without power. He made some steps to the south. Then he saw the piece of the sky slowly in circles returning to the, to the point where it belonged. He fell another time to the ground. He said, I surrender. I surrender my friends. I had three opportunities and you won. Against the common, the common will of the nobles, the rich and the people, I can do nothing. I will tell you what I know. The inscription on the head, it's written in ancient Etruscan language. It's in Latin, it sounds like caput oli, the head of Olus. An ancient hero of the Etruscan past, his burial site was unknown, but there was a prophecy about him. If, if the final resting place was found, well, the final resting place of the, of the hero, of the head of the hero, would become in the future the head of Italy. If I manage to trick you, 
if you put the head on my garden, well, my home would, would became the head of Italy, but you won. So go back, go back to your king and tell what you discovered. They were happy and proud, as you can imagine. They returned to Rome. Well, Probus, Probus became richer and richer. They were, all of them, they were greeted like heroes. Cursor, ha, Cursor became the Princeps Senatus, the most important of the senators of his time. And King Tarquinius, well, King Tarquinius, he was so satisfied that he, in his dream, he, he started to, to imagine his powerful kingdom, the king of all of Italy. He didn't know that one year later, he would lose everything during a revolt. He would become an exile. Nevertheless, he decided to call, to change the name of the, of the Tarpeia rock into the name, with the name Capitolium, Caput Oli, the head of Olus. And he decided at that point to bury the head of the, of the hero in the foundation of the temple. But we are forgetting someone. Rusticus. What happened to him? Well, Rusticus, he, he was greeted like a hero, like all the other three. Before going home, before giving a huge hug to his wife and children, well, he remembered to go to the temple of Romulus, the, the first king of the Romans, Romulus that became after his death an ancestor god for the Roman people. He prayed and he offered the poor food he had. He had nothing else, but he offered it as a thanksgiving to the gods. And when Rusticus was walking out, out from the temple, he didn't notice that the statue of Romulus was smiling at him. The eyes of the statue, for a moment, became blue, deep blue, the color of the sky, the eyes of the mysterious kid they met.